Hi, Robert. Hello. Hello, Robin. Hello. Still having Hi, my tea. I hope you don't mind. I've nearly finished. No, it's no problem at all. We're, uh, we're a little bit early anyway, so it's no problem. We yeah. was uh, so um, I'm Mark. Um, I'm the guy that you was uh, texting on the phone. Yes. And uh, I've just got one of my friends with me. Just um, just sort of been asked to have a have a couple, uh, have a chat. With Paul you. Robert. Paul, hello, hello, Paul. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Nice to meet you too. Thank you very much for spending the time to help. Thank you. Very no welcome at all. Well, so where are you from, Paul? Uh, Paul. <laughs> I know what Paul's um, from. I where come from the from west. Robert? I I come from the West Country, so I'm quite some way away from you. Oh, right, okay. Um, so how did you manage to get in contact with us then? How have you managed to get our number? Um, find a meeting at jw.org. Ah, oh, right, okay. Oh, so you might, I presume you're, you're, living, you're living up here now? No, no, I'm, I'm, well, I'm some way to the south of you at the moment. Okay, okay, all right. So what, what made you uh, look up Wigan then? Well, I wanted a mobile phone number so someone would get back to me. All oh, right, okay. Because a lot of the landline numbers just ring and ring, nobody answers. Ah, right, yeah. Well, that's probably one of the reasons we got a mobile. Just it's a, a little bit easier because um, a lot of the landlines were phones at the halls. So if yes. there was nobody at the hall, it would have been uh, difficult oh, which one? to get back in touch with you. Right. Okay. Thank you. So, have you had contact with the, the witnesses before then, Robert? Yes, yes, I have. Um, but I have been told by them, when I've spoken to them before, go to jw.org and do some research, which is what I have done. Okay. Um, one of the things I came up against um, was a watchtower from 2013 that I mentioned in my text to you. It's the 15th of July, 2013 watchtower. It's the little box at the top of page 22, and it says in the middle column, in 1919, Jesus selected capable anointed brothers to be his faithful and discreet slave. It seems to imply that a faithful and discreet slave was appointed in 1919. You've had quite a few changes in this belief. Um, you didn't believe that brothers were the faithful and discreet slave in 1919. Um, you actually thought it was Pastor Russell alone. Um, I've got a copy of the Finnish Mystery, uh, first edition in 1917, and it says on page five that Pastor Russell filled the office of the faithful and discreet slave. And there's quite a few other Watchtower materials at the time that I've done some research, as I've been told to, um, that, that says more or less the same thing, that Pastor Russell um, filled the office of the faithful and discreet slave. Um, let me see. Watchtower, 1st of April, 1920, page 101. No one in present truth for a moment doubts that Brother Russell filled the office of the faithful and wise servant whom the Lord has made, has made ruler over his household to give them meat in due season. So actually that didn't change till 1927 and then Jesus plus the, all of the Bible students were the faithful and discreet slave and then that changed in 1935. It became just the anointed and there were quite a few more changes. I believe now you teach it's just the, the eight man governing body who are the faithful and wise servant. I have been looking at this for quite some time but is there any biblical evidence for the fact that you believe Jesus chose the Watchtower and appointed a faithful and discreet slave in 1919? Are there any Bible passages you could point to? Thank you. Right, okay. Um, so obviously it's quite a deep subject, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, that's why I gave you notice in, in, a, in, a, in, in advance. Yeah, um, I... I did have a look, and I think I must have got the wrong watchtower then. Um, I was having a look on, on the watchtower. I'm just thinking about that box that you specifically mentioned. Um, <clears throat> so obviously, like, off the top of my head, um, 
for me to sort of just start quoting scripture. Uh, sadly, I'm not I'm I'm not that sort of well equipped um, with the scriptures. I'd have to just go and do a little bit of research myself, just to um, give you some sort of scriptural evidence. I'm thinking we we do have a publication which I, I feel might kind of answer some of these questions that you've got. Obviously, you mentioned about the faithful and discreet slave um, sort of being identified as different people, um, maybe in the past, to, um, to know. Obviously, it is... Um, how do you kind of word it? The scripture that talks about the light getting brighter. No, no, so, no, 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 no. There's, there's no scripture that says that. Proverbs 4.18 says the path of the righteous is illuminated more and more. And it's, it's, it's a figure of speech about it contrasts people who are obedient to Jehovah in Proverbs 4.18 and the wicked who don't, who are not obedient to Jehovah in Proverbs 4.19. It's got nothing to do with doctrine changing. It, it's totally irrelevant and it doesn't say light gets brighter and brighter. Proverbs 4.18, but the path of the just is like the shining sun that shines Robert. ever brighter into the perfect day. Robert? Yeah. Um, as Mark said, it is a to try and do justice to this over Zoom or whatever else can be done. Do you think it would be... Would Jehovah, obviously that I appreciate you, you believe exists, to represent the universal sovereign, would he give his name just to anybody, any people? I'm not interested, honestly. I'm really not interested at all. I, I focus on one thing at a time. I don't do okay. five or six different doctrines all at the same time. And I don't okay. go from Genesis to Revelation and look at 30 scriptures all at the same time. I do one thing. Now, I did text in advance that Watchtower reference to the 15th of July Watchtower, 2013, page 22. And I said, I want to look at the 1919 date. What scriptural evidence do you have that Jesus did a cleansing and an inspection work between 1914 and 1919, and then in 1919 he chose the Watchtower Society? What, what, what biblical evidence do you have for that? As things unfolded from 1914 on, Robert, in the book of Malachi, as we look back, because prophecy often cannot be understood while it's undergoing fulfilment, but only when we can look back at it and see how it's actually being fulfilled. Well, would we you please read the book of Malachi and show me, show me where it mentions Jesus choosing the Watchtower Society in 1919? It will specifically say that he chose the Watchtower Society, Robert. But as we look back at the event of what happened between 1914 through to 1919, we can start seeing how scripture was actually fulfilled. You do, do you accept that 1914 was the year that Jesus Christ was anointed as king of God's kingdom in heaven? No, no. And right. the, the Bible so, students originally taught that Christ became king in 1878. That's in Studies in the Scripture, volume 4, page 604. But about 1930, you abandoned the second presence of Christ as 1874 and Christ becoming king in 1878, and you bumped that up to 1914. There have been numerous changes. Um, I'm not obliged to believe anything that you can't prove to me from the Bible. And I'm not suggesting that you do? Yeah. <clears throat> okay, Paul. But I've certainly looked into 1914. The first century Christians were wrong about God's kingdom being adopted on the earth in, in Jesus' time. Well, you need to prove, you need to show me that. Prove me, show me that from the Bible. Pro prove it to me. Well, in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, what, they thought it was the kingdom of God going to be instantly restored to the earth at that oh, Hold point. on, let's, let's read the verse. If you want to read okay. the verse and, and prove your point. Thank you. Because I do one thing at a time. I want to do, I, I've learned in life it's best to do things well but slowly, one thing at a time. I don't want to rush. Okay. You know, okay. I don't want to go from Genesis to Revelation and do every Christian doctrine in five minutes. Because I think it if you try and do that, you, you, won't, you, won't, you won't actually do it very, very well. Okay. I'm well, at chapter one. You're right, Robert. You're right. So this has been a constant 
issue with the apostles thinking the kingdom of God was going to instantly appear on the earth when Jesus was on the earth. But just before Jesus ascended to the heavens, in verse 6, they asked him again. So when they had assembled, they asked him, Lord, are you restoring the kingdom to Israel at this time? He said to them, it does not belong to you to know the times or seasons that the Father has placed in his own jurisdiction. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be witnesses of me in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the most distant part of the earth. So they obviously preempted and thought something was going to occur and got the timing wrong. Well, Jesus didn't chastise them for doing so. They were on the lookout. They just picked the wrong time. There were other things to do first. So what I'm trying to drive at, Robert, is it, it's not been wrong for the Watchtower Society to be looking. They've not always got things right, but they've always corrected themselves when new information has come out and righted the wrong that they may have got in the past. How do you how do you know that the corrections are indeed correct? How do you know not know that those corrections are also erroneous? Because I would imagine, as everything I do is, I let the scriptures be the guide of what I'm being shown. Well, so whatever well, I'm being told, I've got to corroborate it with the Bible. Well, so far you haven't corroborated anything with the Bible. Acts chapter one, verse six to eight is before the giving of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2. So yes, the apostles were concerned about the kingdom of um, the kingdom of Israel, the, res restoring the kingdom to Israel. But this is before the giving of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2. They didn't make this same mistake after the giving of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2. Unless you can show me from the Bible where after the giving of the Holy Spirit... Um, they made um, a similar mistake. But look, I'm, I'm here. I, I've done a lot of reading. I've done a lot of preparation. I'm here to discuss 1919. Could you, could you show me the 1919 date from the Bible? You mentioned something in Malachi. C could you show me this 1919 date in the Bible, please? Because I'm There's under no, no obligation there, to... There's no to, date there, Robert. It, it just shows events that will be occurring. Well, well go there and, 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 and show me. Onwards. Well, sh how does Malachi relate to 1914 onwards? Could you show me that? Okay. Thank you. So, Malachi chapter 3 talks about when Jesus would uh, and Jehovah would inspect the spiritual state of the earth. You need to read the verse. You need to go yeah. there and read it. C can I just ask, Robert... Um, what what is the what what is the sort of drive behind this? I, f I feel like, without being rude, I feel like you're just here to try and prove a point. Yes, um, I, I I want biblical proof for the 1919 date. Is there any biblical proof for it, or well, not? Like, like um, Paul said, if you're looking for the Bible to say, um, and in 1919 I will appoint the faithful and discreet slave. Well, we're, we're not we're, we're not going to find that, are we? We're not going to find specifically a verse that says, in 1919, I will appoint the faithful and discreet slave. Then why do I have to believe that if it can't be proven from the Bible? Why do I have to believe anything that can't be proven from the Bible? I've spoken in the past to Mormons. They've told me that um, when I've asked them, please show me that from the Bible, all they tell me to do is to pray and have a burning in my bosom. Yeah. And they can't show me anything from the Bible, but they believe that their religion was chosen by heavenly, they call their God Heavenly Father in the 1830s. That's when Heavenly Father chose the Mormon church as the only church on earth that he has any dealings with. All other churches are of the devil, including the um, groups that came later. And the only, the only group that Heavenly Father has dealings with now is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the Mormons. Christadelphians make the same claim. God chose them in the 1860s. Seventh-day Adventists claim God chose them in the 1850s. Victor Paul Werwell claims that God chose the, the Way International in the 1950s. I'm a former Pentecostal. Right? I have nothing to do with it now. Nothing. I absolutely loathe it. But, but you believe in God. 
I believe in God, of course I do, but I have nothing to do with the Pentecostals who claim, some of the more extreme ones, not all of them, but some of the more extreme ones would claim that God has chosen their leaders. They have apostles and prophets on the earth today. And the, if you want to listen to God, you need to throw your Bible away and listen to Benny Hinn or Kenneth Copeland or Todd White or a host of these TV preachers who basically say you don't need the Bible, you need them. They're the way to God. You get to God through these TV preachers. So there's lots of people on earth today <coughs> making, question, make, making the claim that they are chosen by God. Robert? Yes. In the first century, if somebody came to you in Jerusalem and said, how do, they, how do you know this man from Nazareth was the Messiah? They would have had to look in the scriptures to see how prophecy had already been filled and how this man, by looking at his life, how he'd fill that prophecy. Mm -hmm. So in the, when the, uh, the, the wise, the astrologers came to view the birth of Jesus Christ in Bethlehem. The, uh, the uh, religious leaders knew that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem of Ephrathah because of Micah chapter 5 verse 2. They didn't know how all the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle would be fulfilled in Jesus Christ, but they knew little bits. It's the same with this 1919. I know that 1914 is a pivotal day because the Bible tells me. But I hope prophecy unfolds. Where, where itself. does the Bible say 1914 is a pivotal date? In the book of Daniel. It gives the first coming of the Christ in the first century, and it gives the second coming of the Messiah in 1914. But the, but the second coming of Christ hasn't happened yet, so they couldn't have been the second coming in 1914. And originally. What I mean by that, Robert, is the second coming as in. In 1914, when he was anointed in the heavens as God's heavenly king, as the king that Jesus, Jehovah God would use as the king to take authority over this planet, that anointing took place in 1914 in uh, heaven. Right, so if it's in heaven, you're teaching what the Seventh-day Adventists are more or less saying something similar. They believe that an investigative judgment took place in 1844 in heaven. And because it's in heaven, you can't test it, you can't check it. Well, I can check that 1914 is the exact date, because although you said eight, something about Jehovah's Witnesses, 1879, they were preaching that 1914, they wouldn't know how it would unfold properly, but they knew that 1914 was a pivotal date in no, Bible doctrine. No, 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 from the 1890s, I can't remember the references, the Jehovah's Witnesses taught that the second presence of, well, they, they taught the time of the end was 1799. They taught the second presence of Christ was 1874. Now, I've got a book called Prophecy uh, that was published in 1929. As late as 1929, on page 65, it says the, the second presence of Christ was 1874. They taught that Christ became king in 1878. That's in Studies in the Scripture, Volume 4. I think it's page 604. And they taught that Armageddon was going to happen in 1914. 1914 was not the start, it was the end of this system. That's when Armageddon was going to happen. When Armageddon didn't happen, in 1930, they did away with 1799, they did away with 1874, they did away with 1878, and they bumped the second presence of Christ and Christ becoming king up to 1914, with Armageddon sometime in the future. That change took place in 1930. Now, you, you're talking a lot, Paul, but you're not actually showing me anything from the Bible. You've mentioned Malachi, but you haven't read it. You've mentioned Daniel, but you haven't read it. And there seems to be a habit of just talking, Okay. Well, but you're not Daniel's showing me anything from the Bible. I'm under no obligation to believe anything that can't be proven from the Bible. And I'm the same, Daniel, uh, Robert. I want proof from this book that I'm... I go out knocking on doors, Robert, every week. I go speaking to people about this book every week, teaching about a God that I've got to know. You see, you're, you're, you're talking, you're doing more talking, but you're not showing me anything from the Bible. We, we agreed to discuss 1919. You were going to show me this from the Bible. You've mentioned oh, Malachi, you've mentioned Daniel, but you're not reading the Bible. I, you're, you're talking to me. Can I show you the first coming of the Bible determines the first date of the first coming of Jesus Christ in the first century? 
Well, I know that. You don't need to show me something that I know. We're here to discuss 1919. We've only got 40 minutes. But you don't agree with 1940? We've got more than 40 minutes, Rob. It's uh, an unlimited Zoom account. Okay. All right. Could you show me... with 1914, so I can't lay the basis for Malachi and 1919 without laying a basis for 1914. Okay. All right. Well, just show me this from the Bible, if you would. Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 to 26, or 27 actually, whether you're familiar, I presume you're familiar with this passage of scripture, Robert, and it's on about uh, the Jews were in exile in Babylon, Jerusalem had been destroyed, and a clock was... A time period was given here if we read it there are 70 weeks that have been determined for your people and your holy city in order to terminate the transgression to finish off sin to make atonement for error to bring in everlasting righteousness to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the holy of holies you should know and understand that from the issuing of the word to restore and to rebuild jerusalem until messiah the leader there will be seven weeks, also 62 weeks. She will be restored and rebuilt with a public square and moat, but in times of distress. And after the 62 weeks, Messiah will be cut off with nothing for himself. And the people of a leader who is coming will destroy the city and the holy place, and its end will be by the flood. And until the end, there will be war. What is decided upon is desolations. Can you see through that that it's giving us a, a clock, a time period of when the Messiah would come to be seen on the earth, Robert? Yes, it's referring to the birth of Christ in Bethlehem, yes. Well, not to the birth. It's referring to the baptism when he became to be anointed. So the birth, okay. not re irrelevant, but it's not pointing to the birth. Yes, you're absolutely right. I'm, I'm incorrect. It says in verse 24, and to anoint the most holy. I wasn't paying attention. Right. You're absolutely right, yes. Now, I, my understanding as I've looked into this, uh, the Persian ruler attacked Xerxes, gave the order, although the Jews have been back in the Holy Land for many decades at this point, but he gave the order to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem in 455 BCE. King Artaxerxes gave that order. And Nehemiah went back to Jerusalem to start the uh, building of the walls. I understand Bible prophecy of 62 weeks, also seven weeks, that the Jews counted Bible prophecy one day for one year. Do you... Have you ever heard of that before, Robert? Yes. Um, they count one day for one year. Yes, I I have heard of that before. Um, okay. I forget the name of the guy who came up with the idea for that in the early 1800s. Um, I cannot remember his name, I'm sorry. Well, it was the Jews as well. I mean, 40 days in the uh, wilderness and they were punished for 40 years. Mm -hmm. So it was a day for a year. But now... Applying that to Bible been... prophecy, I can't remember the guy's name. Ah, yes, the Reverend John Aquila Brown. Okay. He, okay. He, he came up with the idea that seven times in the book of Daniel and 360 days for a year times seven equals 2,520 years. That was the Reverend John Aquila Brown in a book written in 1823. And do you, what do you think of that yourself? I... Do you, do you... I don't okay subscribe to that, no. You don't? I don't think that um, uh, the number 2,520 years is is indicated in the Bible, no. Okay. Well, let's just stick with this first. Yep. Seven weeks and 62 weeks added together is 69 weeks. Now, if a day for a year is correct, 69 weeks of days is 483 days, 69 times 7. Mm -hmm. If you counted 483 years after 455 BCE, if you look in the book of Luke, chapter 3, 
because Boot Luke was he was establishing a year in Luke chapter 3 by telling us about all the rulers that ruled at that time do you want to read the chapter 1 of verse 3 the Robert read what Paul Ch uh, verse 1 of chapter 3 of Luke Luke chapter 3 verse 1 is that right yeah yeah right yeah, that's right yes of course now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea Herod being tetrarch of Galilee his brother Philip tetrarch of Ituria and the region of Trachonitis and Lystantis tetrarch of Abithene I think I pronounced those correctly yeah, yeah, yeah. that's a bit of a test isn't it <laughs> that's why I've asked you to read it <laughs> <laughs> okay <laughs> but I don't know Luke was establishing the year that John the Baptist baptised Jesus Christ and at that point Jesus was anointed as the Messiah now the book of Daniel said in the the Messiah would come 483 years by that clock mm -hmm. now the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar, do you know when that was? Uh, Tiberius Caesar, I think that would be somewhere around uh, 4 to 6 BC, some Close. time around then. I mean, I time around I'm, not, I'm not too sure. It's the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Augustus Caesar died in 14 CE. So this is Tiberius' 15th year, you're in the year 29 CE. Okay. So 483 years after 455 BCE, the book of Daniel said the Messiah would come in Israel. Okay. And he was pointed to the year 29 CE when he was baptised and Holy Spirit came upon him. It wasn't his birth, it was his anointing with spirit to undertake God's will for him at that time as the Messiah. I can I can certainly see you've certainly pointed out something that I didn't know and to anoint the most holy in Daniel 9:24 which I've I've missed before so I've learned something there you are yeah, um, that this is pointing to Christ not Christ's birth but to Christ's um, baptism when he yeah, was the, anointed. Yeah the birth was important to a point but it wasn't the most important. Okay I ex I accept that thank you very much I I've, I've learned the something thing as well, there. just to uh, how long did Jesus Christ witness for, or how long did he minister for until he was put to death, Robert? Do you know? About three I'm years. Talking. Right, just look in verse 27 of Daniel again, chapter 9. Just to get this day for a year just uh, corroborated and confirmed. Do you want to read the first part of 27 in your Bible, Robert? And he shall confirm a covenant for, with many for one week, but in the middle of the week he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. And right. on the wing of a bomb... Uh, oh, okay. Enough that, Robert. So, a week, a day for a year, seven years is a week. Jesus was put to death halfway through that week, three and a half years. He ministered for that he was put to death. And his death, his blood, brought an end to the sacrifices through the Mosaic law. And the book of Daniel was saying that would occur. At the half of the week, he will call sacrifice and gift offering to cease. So mm -hmm. this day for a year, it's corroborated by that. Yes, it's the Reverend John Aquila Brown's claim that the book of Daniel prophesies the date 2,520 years that I strongly disagree with. I think the oh, wow. name of the book was The Coming of the Lord in Glory and Power or something like that. I can't quite remember. But I know the Reverend John Aquila Brown, um, okay. his idea that the number 2,520 years is found in the book of Daniel. And you can work out biblical prophecy from that. That was taken up by William Miller of the Adventist movement. Uh, okay. He came up with the 1844 date and other groups such as Ellen G. White of the Seventh-day Adventist, they also pointed to that date and Pastor Russell I believe was a split off who added um, a few extra years to that and came up with um, 1873 
sorry, 1874 for the Second Presence of Christ, and then 1914 for Armageddon. Well, you can certainly see the basis for believing that 29 CE was the date the book of Daniel pointed ahead to for the first coming of the Messiah. But many Christians, I'm, I'm, I'm not very familiar with this, to be honest with you, many Christians use this reasoning and this portion of Daniel. You know, there are Baptists, there are Methodists, there are Anglicans, there are Catholics who use uh, Daniel 9 to point to the fact that um, um, this prophesies the coming of Jesus. It's not just, this isn't just something unique to Jehovah's Witnesses. Everybody else is using this too. So, You're right, Robert. But I, a salient point for me is, a very salient point for me, who I was brought up as, as Church of England, but a very salient point to me is, there's only one group of people, as Jesus Christ did, making God's name known on this earth. I'm not interested. I, I, we, we, oh, we I've got we, 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 I do one topic at a time. We, we did, well, did, did, agreed to discuss topic, 1919. Uh, Robert. It is a topic because it's you're, not you're true. Bringing, you're bringing other religions. It's in, not. Saying, it's not true. Other religions use the word Jehovah or Yahweh repeatedly. Jehovah's Witnesses are not the only group to use the word Jehovah. That's just ridiculous. Robert, I was twenty-six years old. That was the first time I'd heard God's name. I don't. I, I don't want to hear what you've got to say on this because we didn't Why? agree to discuss this. We dis we agreed to discuss 1919. I don't want. I've prepared for this. Now, could you show me 1919 from the Bible, please? I I don't want to get sidetracked with another topic. If you wish to discuss another topic, I'm happy to do that. But on okay. another occasion, where we just stick to that one agreed topic, I'm not discussing something. And 20 minutes in, we change the topic, go on to something else, um, and and Robert, then every 20 minutes, the the theme is changed. I'm not changing the subject it was in answer to what you brought in saying that other religions mention this I've yes they do they, they, they all mention um, that this refers to the coming of Jesus Christ now you are right it refers to the anointing of Christ at his baptism not to his birth in Bethlehem I haven't looked at this for quite some time and you were right on that and I was wrong so I admit my error there but there are Baptist groups I've got systematic theologies that refer to this um, Baptist, Methodist, Pentecostal, uh, all sorts, Lutheran, Catholic, they all refer to this verse. So, okay, you've, you've made a valid point. I agree with what you say. This points to the coming of Christ prophetically. I remember back in the 1990s listening to a tape series by the Reverend Dr. Walter Martin, who was an American uh, Baptist. He was quite an incredible guy, Walter Martin. I think, yeah, he died in 1990, so probably he would have done the series in the 1980s. And I haven't listened to these tapes for 30 odd years, but he went into Daniel 9 in great detail, pointing out that this talked, as you have said, to the coming of the Christ, to the anointing of the Christ. So he's a Baptist. So, you know, you're really wasting my time because you're telling me something that everybody else is saying. Now, I'm here to discuss 1919. Could you show me that from the Bible, please? Well, we'd have to get go in, back into the book of Daniel, yep. chapter 4, to establish 1914. Okay. Right, I'm there. To understand that the King Nebuchadnezzar was given a vision of a tree being chopped down which represented God's rulership on the throne in Jerusalem by the line through David. And this vision was, was, this vision was played out in something that happened to Nebuchadnezzar. If you look from verse in chapter four, verse 13, As I viewed the visions of my head while on my bed, I saw a watcher, a holy one, coming down. Where are you? Heavens. Where are you reading from? Verse thirteen of chapter. Oh, 13. four. I do beg your pardon. Yes, Daniel four thirteen. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt you. I saw a watcher, a holy one, coming down from the heavens. He called out loudly, chopped down the tree, which represented God's, or at this point, Nebuchadnezzar's rulership. 
Chop down the tree, cut off its branches, shake off its leaves and scatter its fruit. Let the beasts flee from beneath it and the birds with its branches. But leave the stump with its roots in the ground with a banding of iron and of copper among the grass of the field. Let it be wet with the dew of the heavens, let, it be, let its portion be with the beasts among the vegetation of the earth. And let its heart be changed from that of a human, and let it be given the heart of a beast, and let seven times pass over it. Right, now please don't tell me that seven times means seven times 360, which equals 2,520 years, because nobody taught that until the year... 1823 when a lunatic clergyman called the Reverend John Aquila Brown uh, wrote a book uh, claiming that seven times means seven times 360 years where you take a day for a year. I, I have no problem with a day for a year in Daniel 9 to come up with the um, anointing of the Christ, no trouble at all, but I vehemently, vehemently state that seven times does not mean 2,520 years. That's the basis of the Adventist movement. It was started in the year 1823. Nobody taught this before 1823. When this lunatic clergyman, the Reverend John Aquila Brown, came up with this, it influenced William Miller of the Adventist movement, who said, well, if you start in the Old Testament and you count 2,520 years on, you come up with 1844. No, it was actually 1843 at the start. And then when, then when the second coming of Christ didn't happen in 1843, he said, ah, there's no year zero. So there's only one year between 1 BC and 1 AD, not two years. So he then came up with his second stab, which was 1844. And that was a false prophecy. Now, the Adventists and the Reverend John Aquila Brown have been proven to be false prophets proven okay. false prophets I would be a fool to listen to um, this seven times has a range of different meanings it could mean seven days seven weeks seven months seven years right I think it means three and a half years and I'll tell you why in Babylon it's very hot so uh -huh. the only notice they, they don't really notice spring and autumn because it's so hot so the only two seasons that they really notice are summer when it's blazing hot and winter yeah. when it's just moderately hot so when it says seven times I think it probably refers to seven seasons which in Babylon they only had two winter and summer and there is a scholar called Rendell Harris who suggests that, um, again, because they only had two seasons that they could determine in Babylon, it's likely that seven times refers to seven seasons or three and a half years. But whether it's three and a half years or seven years or seven weeks or seven months, the one thing I can tell you with absolute certainty it does not refer to it does not refer to 2,520 years. A day for a year, I've got no problem whatsoever in Daniel 9 to come up with um, the anointing of the Christ. No problem at all. But seven times, I can assure you, sir, does not mean 2,520 years. That's been okay. proven to be false prophecy. I believe it's true. Without a shadow of a doubt, I believe it's true. It stems from 6 or 7 BC when the last king in Jerusalem ruled on Jehovah's throne, King Zedekiah, and 6 or 7 o'clock, as in Daniel's book, in 455, a clock was ticking from 6 or 7, and 2,520 years later, which comes in 1914, as Jesus Christ said, that clock was still running in, in Luke chapter 21, where he said that Jerusalem was still being trampled on by the nations, because that time period... Jehovah God has allowed the nations to rule independent so, without any intervention of him since Zedekiah was stripped of his kingship so you in believe, BCE. So, John, you believe, Paul, Paul, you believe that Jehovah inspired the Reverend John Aquila Brown, a clergyman, I don't know which denomination he was, you believe that Jehovah inspired the Reverend John Aquila Brown 
for the first time in human history in the year 1823 to come up with the idea that seven times of Daniel chapter 4 verse 16 means 2,520 years. I don't think Reverend Aquila uh, came up with the date of Jerusalem's last king Zedekiah in 607 BCE. I think that's a matter of historical accuracy. The 2,520 I years... I thought, well, well firstly the watchtower literature, the early watchtower literature claimed that Jerusalem fell in 606 BC. Okay. Right. When um, when they found there was no year zero, zero. Th they had to increase 1914 to 1915, which they did briefly in um, various editions of studies in the scripture. And then they abandoned that and they changed 606 to 607 BCE. Which is why, Rob, when at the very beginning I tried to reason with you that although the disciples continuously got things wrong, and they did, because of their heart, they continued to be blessed by Jesus and his Father and were given the work to preach the good news in the first century, despite their getting certain things wrong. When I look back at the activities of Jehovah's Witnesses over the last century or so, they have got things wrong. But I can look back over the century and see where they've put things right and everything I've checked, because I ain't going knocking on doors for no reason, and trying to convince people for no reason. I am convinced that the dates I have, 607, the very first what thing What happened in, in Matthew, 607? The very first thing Jesus Christ said in Matthew 24 as the sign of his presence would be nation would rise against No, nation. he did not. You're misquoting Matthew 24. I'm not no, he did not. It. No, I'm you, not you, see, it. you see, you do this because you don't read the text. I do read the text. No, you don't. You did not read the text there. They're outside the temple. Uh, by the way, right. I want to know what happened in 607 BC because Jerusalem fell 20 years later in 587. Not, not... No, Jerusalem fell in 607. Which and scholar Zedekiah states was... that Jerusalem fell in 607? Could you, name me, could you name me one historical source that says Jerusalem fell in 607? Don't refer to the Watchtower literature. Name one scholar or one scholarly source that says Jerusalem fell in 607. Because you, you were talking about Je uh, something to do with Zedekiah, but I thought your literature says that um, Jerusalem fell in 607, and that's where you start your 2,520 years from. Robert, going through all this, and I'm not being disrespectful, if God exists, and I firmly believe he does exist, he would make sure truth was available for those who wanted it. John, John, could, could we, look, don't introduce a new topic. Well, you've it's mentioned 607, topic, which you haven't proven. I've also said that you misquoted Matthew 24. Can I deal with Matthew 24? And then you deal with 607. The first sign is not nation rising against nation. It's religious deception. If you read Matthew 24, 1, then Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said to them, Do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone will be left upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, his disciples came to him privately, saying, and this is confusing now, because Matthew groups things in threes. Jesus is asked four questions, not three. But Matthew ignores one of those questions and he groups things in threes. You have to go to the parallel account in Luke to find the other question. So bear that in mind. Verse 3, tell us when will these things be? That's the first question. Second, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Um, you have to, actually it's Matthew 13, Mark, Mark 13, 4 for the other question. Because he's asked two He's asked, he's asked questions about the destruction of the temple and the end of the age and the sign of the destruction of the temple and the sign of the end of the age. Now here's Jesus' first reply. It's not nation rising against nation, as you said. You were incorrect, Paul. It's deception. Verse 4, And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you. That's the first prophetic sign. It's false 
doctrine, it's religious deception. For take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ. Christ means the anointed. Right? And I would point that out because you believe there are 144,000 anointeds, which would be another Christ. I am the Christ, singular, and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumours of wars. So yes, it does mention wars or rumours of wars, but before that, it's religious deception and it's warning people about false Christs. Now, that's which my response to Matthew which 24. Is, which has gone on for years, Robert. Even before 1914, there's been religious deception. But the very first thing in verse 7 that stands out is nation will right, because there's never been a world war where nation rules against nation. No, no, you're in, you're in, you're in, you're incorrect. Um, there have well, been wars where more people were killed than in the First World War. The Second World War has the most deaths at about 50 to 60 million. The First World War is about 17 million. But there's been two other wars where they literally invaded China and killed everyone, where more people were killed than the First World War. And these happened centuries ago. I think one of them happened millennium uh, a, a millennia ago so um, the well, idea that the first world war was the biggest war in human history is not true there were, there, well, I, th I think if you look it up there are two other wars that involved the invasion of China where more people were killed than in the first world war but you are missing verse 4 and 5 Jesus' first warning is take heed that no one deceives you for many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ, meaning I am the anointed or, or an anointed one. And that's what we see today. That's my own background. I used to be a Pentecostal. And the Pentecostal churches are on TV. I'm not saying they're all crazy people. I do believe there are some, a few godly people among this, amongst them. But unfortunately, the crazy ones that you see on TV, they claim to be anointed. They claim that they have a special dispensation from God who's speaking to them directly and has given them an anointing. And so beware of people who claim to be anointed or that there is a class of people who are the anointed because the anointed means the Christ. Would you prove to me what happened in 607? I thought that the Watchtower literature, originally you taught that Jerusalem fell in 606. And when they found out there was no year zero, they briefly uh, bumped up 1914 to 1915. I've got an early copy of Studies in the Scripture that comes up with the 1915 date um, for Armageddon. Um, I cannot remember the reference for the life of me. But then they decided very quickly after that to bump back 606 to 607. But the early Watchtower literature says Jerusalem fell in 606. They're just making this up, mate. There, is, there are no scholars who say that Jerusalem fell in 606 or 607. And Can I, you name I one? Come on here to, to, to uh, convince me that I'm wrong. Have you come on here to convince you? No, no, no. Wrong, no I'm, I'm looking for you to show me a scholar or some scholarly source that says Jerusalem fell in 606 or 607. A scholarly? Yeah. Because you... You're on about worldly people who are scholars who put dates on all manner of things. Someone with an, an eminent uh, science, whatever uh, university background, puts a date on it, you'll accept it. Well, everyone, everyone gives the same date. Everyone. You could even go to Encyclopedia Britannica, which is not produced by scholars. It's produced with people with usually a bachelor's degree level of education, as far as I know. There are a couple of articles from... Uh, people more work, but many Encyclopedia Britannica articles. Uh, <laughs> even Britannica says Jerusalem fell five eight seven. Now, if you've got, can you just show me some evidence? I'm looking for evidence proof, because six oh seven is the start of your two thousand five hundred and twenty years. This number that you get from the Reverend John Aquila Brown, a strange clergyman, a lunatic basically, who you believe that Jehovah, that Jehovah used. Well, no one taught 2,520 years before the Reverend John Aquila Brown's book in 1823. So who's got the truth, John, Robert? Pardon? Who's got the truth? You're changing the topic. You're trying no, to I've change the ask, topic. 
because it all comes to motive, Robert. I'm just trying to find out what your motive is in asking these questions. I want to obey. To... I want to obey Jehovah God, but I don't believe that there is any evidence that the Watchtower was chosen in the year 1919 any more than there is evidence that God chose the Mormon Church in the 1830s or God chose the Seventh-day Adventists in the 1850s as his sole representative on earth or God chose the Christadelphians the 1860s as his sole representative on earth so, every other group is of the devil or that God chose the Way International in the 1950s there's no evidence that God's chosen any of these groups they just make this up to give themselves authority that's what so, these religious groups God, God do. God has chosen one of the groups, so hasn't it, Robert? Sorry? God, God has to have chosen one of the groups. No, he doesn't. No? No. So, what, are you saying that God doesn't have uh, a people on earth? He does have a people, but he doesn't have an organisation or a group that he has chosen, unless you can prove it to me from the Bible. Oh, I've got to just turn the power on. The screen's... I'm going to... The battery's going to cut off. Hang on, just a second. Right. Um, no, what happens is people give themselves authority and they say, we are the leader of this group and, and God speaks to us. And anyone outside of our little group, they're of the devil. I, I'm a former Pentecostal, right? I got involved in a quite extreme Pentecostal group called the Oneness or Jesus Only. And they, they claim that they're the only group on earth. All other groups are of the devil. And it's a load of bunkum. It's just ignorant, uneducated people giving themselves authority and then scamming people for all the money that they can get and wasting people's lives where people spend their entire life going to these stupid buildings, being brainwashed with the same repetitive nonsense over and over again so you don't think outside the box. Well, that's not the evidence I've found within Jehovah's Witnesses, Robert. Would you like to talk again, maybe on a different topic? Because I don't want to discuss this again, because I feel you, the pair of you haven't really prepared. Um, there is another chapter in this book that I found I interesting. Explain, Robert. Um, so you're saying we're not prepared. Like I said in my text, I've been camping and I literally picked up my phone today. So when I, when I text you, um, we was going to our meeting and, and I've asked Paul what literally maybe an hour, an hour before we met, met you. So it's, it's not that we've ill prepared. It's right. just that we was keen to uh, come and say hello, just show our faces and, uh, and have a friendly discussion with you. But it just, it feels like, um, what's the word? I, I feel like you, you're just wanting to prove an argument um, that there's... Of course, I of course I want to find out whether something is true or not because if it's true, I can obey it. But if it's if it's not true, I don't have to obey it. I do thank the pair of you for Daniel nine twenty four and to anoint the most holy. It doesn't refer to Christ's birth; it refers to his baptism in Jordan. So I've learned something there, and I will not forget that. And I appreciate that from the pair of you. Thank you for that. But I'm, I'd rather knock this on on the head. I mean, perhaps there's a problem that I've spent many hours preparing for this discussion and perhaps you aren't aware of the, the time and effort that I've put in. Would you wish to discuss a different topic? This is your book. I wrote away for a paper copy of your book. There's chapter 13. Um, it says in paragraph 2 that true religion should not get involved in warfare and politics. If you prepare for that, would you be willing to speak again? But we just stick to that one topic. I don't want to talk about 1914 or 1919. I'm not interested in anything what, other than warfare and politics. What, what is it that you're wanting to discuss in particular? What What's the sort of the objective of discussing that particular topic? All right, I'll have to read it to you, and then I'll tell you why I find it interesting. Um, it's page 55, lesson 13, paragraph two. False religion does not treat people as Jehovah does. The Bible says that false religions' sins have massed together clear up to heaven. For centuries, religions have meddled in politics, supported wars, and caused to approve the deaths of countless numbers of people. Some religious leaders enjoy a lavish lifestyle <coughs> and demand money from their followers to pay for it. 
These actions prove they do not even know God, yet alone have the right to represent him. The book seems to be fairly emphatic in saying that religions cannot get involved in poor politics and cannot support wars. I was wondering if you could prove that from the Bible. Okay. Well, I will I will give you a text, Robert. Yeah. And uh, I'll sort something out with you, okay? Okay. And thank you, Paul, for Daniel 9.24. I learned something there, so I appreciate that, sir. You're welcome, Robert. Nice to talk to you. Okay. Thank you very Have much. Have a day, Robert. All the nice best. Nice speaking to you. Thank See you. See you later, mate. Bye. Bye, Robert. Bye-bye, sir. Bye. Bye, sir.